like another drink, Toddy? I'd love one, Henry. Well, I'll ring for the Batman. Good, sir. Car, I call it the Mayflower on account of all the Puritans who've come across in it. Now to 20-year-old Pam up to the wood near Boulder Dam, park the car, thought that she'd know what to do. I say, get in the back now, Pam. She said, what the hell do you think I am? I want to stay in the front seat here with you. Whoa, give me an older woman every time, every time. Give me an older woman every time. Cause they don't yell and they don't tell and all they're grateful as hell. So give me an older woman every time. Now the day my Uncle Joe married my Aunt Flo, he was 44 and she was 69. That night as I lay on my bed, well, I heard every word they said. I couldn't help it because their room was next to mine. He said, how about it, dear? She pretended not to hear. He begged and pleaded till his voice was hoarse and deep. He said, oh, how about it, Flo? She said, how about what, Joe? He said, how about back in the center of the fair was getting some sleep? <laughs> oh, give me an older woman every time, every time. Oh, give me an older woman every time. Cause they don't yell and they don't tell it. Oh, they're grateful as hell. So give me an older woman every time. Last year I divorced Maureen, now she was just 19. The day that she became my bony bride. She was as cold as charity, just as frigid as could be. Well, when she opened her mouth, a little light came on inside. <laughs> now, last week I met her at a party. I was feeling kind of gay and kind of hearty, and several whiskeys had sharpened up my wit. I said, how about a bit of whoopee? She said, over in my dead body. I said, Maureen, gal, you haven't changed a bit. <laughs> oh, give me an older woman every time, every time. Give me an older woman every time. Cause they don't yell and they don't tell and oh, they're grateful as hell. So give me an older woman every time. Now, when I was just a boy, I took a little gal called Joy down to the meadow and we lay down by a hedge. I said, you know, my pretty little squaw, what your lovely lips are for? She said, to stop my mouth from fraying round the edge. <laughs> now, I tell you, my wife's 53, but you know, she still suits me, though of later hearing it really ain't so hot. But at night, as I lay on my bed, I put my lips up close to her head, and I say, well, you going to sleep or what? And she says, what? <laughs> oh, give me an older woman every time, every time. Give me an older woman every time. Cause they don't yell and they don't tell and oh, they're grateful as hell. So give me an older woman, a real hot bloody woman, a right and bitchy woman. Give me an older woman every time. Cow battle. Ooh, wee, ain't that nice? <laughs> Here, on the um, south coast of England, just a few short miles from Folkestone, the enterprising face of industry's private sector has manifested itself. Impatient with administrative delays, one of our best-known northern entrepreneurs has pushed the boat out and is going ahead with one his own short. channel tunnel. What? One short! You want salt? Yeah. But you said you were one short! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The man behind it all, Mr. Fred Scuttle. Good evening, viewers, and welcome... Tell me, Mr. Scott. Uh, how long have you been at it? <laughs> how long have I been at what, sir? How long have you been in this whole boring business? <laughs> very interesting, sir. I mean, a whole boring business, sir. I'm very sorry, sir. <laughs> I didn't get the infection of your nuances, did I, there, sir? No. We have been digging, sir. Actually, physically digging, sir. <laughs> For the last three weeks. Uh, have you um, been subsidised? <laughs> no, sir, no. I haven't, sir, no. One about some of the lads, you know. <laughs> I haven't inquired, sir. There's no skin off my nose one way or the other. Sir. We don't pry, you see, sir, we don't pry. When did you uh, implement your recruitment programme? Sir? Get staffed. 
months ago, sir, months ago. <laughs> and I got the best, sir. You've heard of the lump? Mm -hmm. I've got the dollop. <laughs> Little Willie Lee doesn't know the meaning of the word fear, doesn't know the meaning of the word claustrophobia, sir. <laughs> doesn't know the meaning of the word hazardous. Why is that? He's Chinese. <laughs> The little fella that went out just now, Atlas Charlie. Atlas? Never wears that. <laughs> it's full of shellfish, you see. He, collect, he collects them. He's got the biggest collection of seashells on the seashore south of, in England here. Well, I didn't think much of his muscles. You haven't seen his cockles, have you? <laughs> How many are there in your consortium? At any given moment, one, sir. <laughs> when they are sitting. You see, sir, I should think lunchtime will be empty now, sir. You lose it to your heart's content, sir. <laughs> yes. Is there a newspaper behind you? <laughs> yes, yes, sir. It's the Sunday time. No, I tell a lie, sir, it's the melody maker. I get them modelled up, they're so similar, you see. <laughs> It's caught up in the square. Ah! <laughs> it belongs in the consortium, sir. That's the only time my lads will read anything. <laughs> That's why they're so misinformed, you see. They never get the complete story. How much is this tunnel going to cost? And may I be frank, sir? If you wish. I'll be honest if you rather. <laughs> All right, sir. Give or take a pee. <laughs> £726.50p. Is that a conservative estimate? The same one I showed to Adam Wilson. <laughs> he could have had the glory of this, sir. I showed Barbara Castle my manifesto in front of witnesses. She turned her back on me, sir. That was taking a chance. <laughs> we was going to have... <laughs> We was going to have Sir Alec Douglas home down here to turn the first sod over. <laughs> Coming down here, sir. Hume. Hume. Sir Alec Douglas Hume. Did he arrive? No, sir. He was ill in bed with Flo. <laughs> I mean, it's all right. They're ignoring us, but they're not in reality, sir, because outside they've got a Navy, navy one of them tug things. They're spying on us. They've got a Navy bar. They've got one of them out there. Frigate. Quite right, sir. <laughs> but nevertheless, sir, in seven weeks' time, we shall have our gala opening, sir. And 60 girl guides are going to cycle four abreast. That's too deep. <laughs> well, it's very wide, you see, sir. Right the way across, and they'll be coming... And, uh, they'll come up there, sir. Yes, sir. They'll come up in France. Yes, possibly, sir. <laughs> but do you really think that you can dig this tunnel in seven weeks? I have implemented, sir, a new and novel incentive scheme. Oh, what's that? I pay them in francs. <laughs> <laughs> really? Well, Mr Scuttle, we have actually made a film of your men at work, and I'm sure the viewers would like to see what can be done with British grit. <laughs>
historic subterranean monument to man's ingenuity. The skeleton! <laughs> You see, the way to spell it, I'm sure, is uh, W-O-O-M-E. Huh. No, 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 Henry, no, no. I am quite certain it is W-H-O-O-M. Womb. Oh, sir. Excuse me, sirs. Yeah. The way to spell womb is W O M B. Womb. You know something, Robert. I'm bloody sure that girl's never even heard an elephant with the wind. It's <laughs> womb! <laughs> oh, oh, hi, Zeke. How's the wife? Yes, fine, Lynn. Yes, fine. <laughs> Hell was mine. Fun. <laughs> it's fun. Oh, he's got your husband's mouth. <laughs> yeah, but he's got his father's eyes. <laughs> damn it, damn it. Hey, how did you come to hurt your leg? I didn't come to hurt my leg. I came to mend the roof. <laughs> hurt my leg. Oh, I'd like to see your specimen, please. My what? Could you fill that glass? Not from here. <laughs> um, I could try it. I could try it from there. You know something? My Daisy May always closes her eyes when we make love. Has done ever since the day we got married. Just hates to see me enjoy myself. <laughs> On the top of the evening to you. Now, here's where the <laughs> mammies and the dads can relax and stop trying to fight the flower. Because <laughs> the young'uns are going to take the floor. I hope they bring it back when they're done with it. Because <laughs> we want to find out our Wolpicon's winner of the Quick Step competition.
for the result here with bated breath. <laughs> I always bait me breath when I'm fishing for compliments. <laughs> and, ah, here we are. The judges have come up with the winners, finally. Anyway, I'm going to keep you in suspenders just a little bit longer. And I'm going to read them out, the first three, in reverse order, you see. You understand what I mean? I'm doing it like, you know. <laughs> You'll see it later. Right, now the third ones are Fred and Leslie Wilcox from Penge. <laughs> ah, that's fine. And now, here at number two, they're coming in with the twinkling toes, and it's Ted and Tina Tingle from Tootsie. <laughs> Now, it's the moment that you've all been waiting for. The winners of this all-winners competition, and here they are. It's Jean and John Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> And so, with Fred Bugle in the, in the orchestra, uh, playing us out with uh, I'll Be Seeing You in all the various places. Um, and the balloons cascading down, uh -oh. Cascade, ca cascading down over the, this, this glamorous fair with the dancers or dancers and everything. Um, I'll say good night to, to you from, from, from the Neil Lockton Ball. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to welcome to the show the one and only Anne Shelton! You put your hand in the hand of the man who still the water You put your hand in the hand of the man who calmed the sea Take a look at yourself and you can differently by putting your hand in the hand of the man from Galilee. Well, every time I look into the holy book, I want to tremble. When I come to the part how the carpenter cleared the temple. Cause the buyers and the sellers are no different fellows than what I profess to be. And it causes me shame to know I'm not the girl that I should be You put your hand in the hand of the man who still the water You put your hand in the hand of the man who calmed the sea Take a look at yourself and you Just can look at others differently by putting your hand in the hand of the man from Galilee My mama taught me to pray before I reach the age of seven When I'm down on my knees That's when I'm close to heaven My daddy lived his life With four kids and a wife He knew what he had to do And he taught us a lot And I'm a-passing it on to you You put your hand in the hand Of the man who still the water you put your hand in the hand of the man who calmed the sea. Take a look at yourself and you Just can look at others differently. By putting your hand in the hand of the man from Galilee. You put your hand in the hand of the man who calmed the sea. 
the man who stilled the waters, yes he did. You put your hand in the hand of the man who calmed the sea. Take a look at yourself and you can look at others differently. I put your hand in the hand of the man from Galilee. I put your hand in the hand of the man from Galilee. Once again, we present Departure Lounge, where people who are leaving this country, sometimes for very personal reasons, sometimes for good, tell us why. Miss Andre Melly. There can't be many people viewing this evening who don't know the name Mervyn Craddy. Uh, pilloried in the press, shunned by society, he has been obliged to leave the country. But how is it that a man, young, intelligent, good-looking and talented, <laughs> finds himself in this position. Well, it's a bit sordid. <laughs> That's all right, I understand. <laughs> well, you see, <clears throat> it all started for me about five years ago. I remember it quite well, because it was the day after my 21st birthday party. And me and my friend Mark, who's a very kind, considerate and warm-hearted property developer, <clears throat> <laughs> went for a stroll up in Soho. All we wanted was a breath of fresh air. I mean, it was all quite innocent. At what time was this? Three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> we passed an establishment called the Sexy Erotica Playgirl Club. A blonde stood in the doorway with heavily massacred eyeballs. <laughs> a low-cut blouse barely concealing her ample portions. Ample pr pr proportions. Oh, old sailor, she quilped. <laughs> Come inside. The place is full of fun-loving girls. Thinking only to have a cup of tea and perhaps a Manchester tart. <clears throat> and perhaps a quick 50 up on the dartboard. <laughs> Me and my friend went inside, but inside it was like a den of inequality. It was like the Tower of Barbell. It was like that film about Gomorrah and that other place. Sodom. Anyway, a lady walked towards me. <laughs> she was carrying a whip and wore a fireman's helmet, bus driver's overcoat, tram driver's gloves, a, rob a rubber body belt. <laughs> and clogs. <laughs> she asked me if I was interested in a special service. What did you say? I said I wasn't very religious. <laughs> it was then that you met this musician, Sarah. Yes, yeah, she had arrived to take part in an all-night jam session, and I helped her unpack her cello. <laughs> I sat there and watched her all night absolutely enthralled. She played it side saddle. <laughs> I thought it was very courageous, without spurs. Uh, that's how it all started. Yes, one night, <clears throat> I went to a party. It was a surprise party. Well, it was for me, anyway. <laughs> it was given by the second banjo player of the London Sympathy Orchestra. My head, dizzy with champagne and ruby-type Algerian South African port-style empire wine, I inadvertently and rather foolishly fondled one of Ivy Benson's. <laughs> One of Ivy Benson. Musicians. <laughs> the trombone player. I'd never been close to a trombone player before. I mean, it's not like a trumpet player or a French horn. Mm. They have bigger embouchures. <laughs> Perhaps that's got something to do with it. I don't know. But I just knew that from that moment on, I was going to be... A, a croupier? A groupie! <laughs> Groupie. Well, isn't that someone who offers their favours to pop stars? Yes, I just couldn't help myself. They used to draw me just like a maggot. I mean... Go on. Well, you see, one night I went to see the Updike Ladies Colliery Band. They was playing for the Chalfont St Giles, Old Age Pensioners, 
all-nude limbo dance team. <laughs> I remember it very well because I had to lower the loo doors. Because <laughs> some of them was getting in free. So. <laughs> Anyway, there I was outside the stage door of the Broadbent Hall with my ballpoint in my hand when I was set upon by a gang of girls on motorbikes all wearing leather gear. And they was like hooligans they was. They all come after me and, and I was for the first time and I hope that never happens again, victim of a gang plank. A gang plank? A gang bang! <laughs> Girls uh, uh, had their way with you. All except the little fat one. <laughs> Why was that? I didn't fancy her. <laughs> and after that, I like uh, I, I I come back to town with your tail between your legs. <laughs> became um... yes i'm not ashamed to admit it i became a call boy <laughs> i'm not afraid of it <coughs> i came from a home for unmarried fathers remember i mean at least <laughs> at least i was a high class call boy you don't know what it's like you don't know what it's like to be young and attractive <laughs> every night outside the stage door they was waiting for me duchesses and hairlesses heiresses <laughs> And lady TV producers with tempting offers, all looking at me and bearing me in mind. And uh, one of them was, of course, a member of the government. That's quite right. The Minister for Underworld Affairs. The Under Minister for World Affairs. Lady Porker. Was there ever anything between you? Not very often. <laughs> What happened? Well, then you see this chap from the Sunday newspaper got hold of me and he wanted me to take sort of photographs of her and compromising positions and that, you know, with my Polaroid. <laughs> <laughs> and to, like, take down everything what she said, like all the words she spoke and that, you know. Uh, but surely it was your word against hers. No, no, you see, because he had furnished me with a miniature tape recorder, what I had secreted about my person. <laughs> and so everything she said, I got down, she couldn't argue against that, could she? Uh, and um, that escapade in the nudist camp. <laughs> oh, I showed him a thing or two there, didn't I? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I exposed every, every... See, I had to pretend to be one of them. Not one, not one of the, one of the, I had to go along like a nudist and that. You had to be nude and everything, but I got it down every word she spoke. <laughs> but if you were nude, how did you record all those confessions of hers? With great difficulty. <laughs> and not a little discomfiture. <laughs> but I hasten to add, we was never romantically attached. It was nothing like that. Oh, no, 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 we was, we, we was only good friends, only good friends. Now, I find that very hard to believe. I mean, you are very attractive. I know. <laughs> But just the same, whenever she got, like, a bit fruity or anything like that, you know, I used to put a knockout drop in her cocoa. She used to go, spark out, out like a light. <laughs> Didn't you feel guilty? Only once. <laughs> when was that? When she asked for a second cup. <laughs> and now, with public opinion so very much against you, you are having to leave the country. That's quite right. I'm going to Spain. Uh, how will you manage? Well, that should be all right. You know, I got the yacht and the villa that Lady Porker bought me and the 40,000 quid I got from the newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> Won't you be lonely? I shouldn't think so. You ready, girls? <laughs> Come on, Dubs. Right. Here we are. Right. I hope the plane doesn't go without you. <laughs> I shouldn't think so. I only bought it this morning. <laughs> I say, Trumpshaw, give it a kick, get it started, will you? Off we go. <laughs> that sad story of a boy who went wrong, I must say good night and cycle back to town. <laughs> Coffee. Uh, tea, tea. 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 Sugar? Yeah, yes, please. <laughs> Milk? No, oh. thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the farinaceous ladybirds. <laughs> Then the big bird put one right in two. He married them one very soon. 
Then let's begin. Little Bo Peep has lost her sheep and doesn't know where to find them. Leave them alone and they'll come home, bringing their tails behind them. There, children, that's a nursery rhyme. It's a story and it could, of course, be told in many other ways. Good evening. <laughs> Now, I want you, if you will, to cast your minds back to last February the 31st. When somewhere in this area up here, several sheep were stolen. Now, one of the gang was seen making his getaway in a stolen car, which he drove the wrong way up a one-way street. And he tried to squeeze between two oncoming juggernaut lorries. So do be on the lookout for a tall, thin Cortina. Now, I want you to look at this jumper here, because the police have a theory that some of the sheep have already been shorn and their wool made up into these jumpers, which is produced by the Lubtish Group of Switzerland. So if you are out anywhere and uh, you see a girl that you don't know very well and you see her wearing one of these, just go up and do look inside for that label. <laughs> now, if you see that label in there, what you must do is to limp along to your nearest phone box and get it immediately with Inspectors Blackhead and Boy. Red Pimple Lane. Sheepen! Sheepen! Where are you, Sheepen? Can you stop that to do you? Can you stop that to do you? Come, Marini! But don't you tell? Can you do you? Young Boo Pepper? Do we have Boo Pepper? Yeah, I have lost my sheep. Lost the sheep, eh? We must look for the sheep. Yeah, we must look for the sheep. Yeah. Oh, guck mal. Beginning raining. Okay. Guck mal, beginning raining. Ooh. We can now look for the sheep in the raining. Ooh. <laughs> what can we do in the raining? <laughs> for the Jürgen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's good. Come on, Amy. Ah. 
<laughs> People looking for my sister. Two sisters? Ja, Boo Peppa. Oh, Boo Peppa with the blonde hair and the grüte brüste. Ja. In the frilly neck. Wir müssen looking for the sheep. Ja, wir müssen looking for the sheep. Ja. Oh, guck mal. Wir gehen rein. Nein. Ja, rein. Nein. Rein kommt soon. Oh. Und wenn rein kommt, wir können looking for the sheep in die Rhein. Ja. <lacht> Voll die Jürgen. Du mir hier? Ja. Ist gut. Ja, ja ist gut. <lacht> Ja, los die Schiepen, ja. Wir müssen looking für die Schiepen. Ja, wir müssen looken für die Schiepen. Ja. Oh, beginnen reinen. Look, <lacht> beginnen reinen. No, beginnen reinen. Ja, we can't looken für die Schiepen in der reinen. <lacht> ja, wir können looken für die Schiepen in der reinen. <lacht> Thousand sheep missing since yesterday have so far not been found. Nathan Wide reports. Query. Ockley Moor. Yesterday, the home of some two thousand sheep. Today, a barren wasteland. The owner of the sheep, Miss Peep, is baffled, as indeed are the local police, who have not ruled out foul play. For the past seventeen hours, two men. Uh, one of them, the local switchboard attendant, the other, uh, the shepherd, who was in charge of them, have been helping the police with their inquiries. No, well, you see, he said to me, he said, two thousand sheep, you see. Well, I thought he said two thousand and sheep. You see, that, that's two thousand and two sheep. You see, that's... Well, I'll tell you two. Two thousand two. Two thousand and two sheep. <laughs> she, she's Billy. A Tilly Todd, she is. A Tilly Todd works on the stains. <laughs> Not <Nuts> girl. <laughs> Tilly Todd, yes. <laughs> no, these definitely stole, sir. There's no doubt about that. I mean, they couldn't all have gone in the bog. There ain't room for all sheep, sir. We've had a search party out, and like you say, my, my, my sons, my seven sons and my six daughters are all joined, joined in the search party to do their best, like you see, because not only did they get away with all them sheep, sir, but they also got away with the sheep virility pills, you see. That's to, like, to make the sheep more, uh, give them a bit of, you know, <laughs> being delicate, sir. I'm sorry about that, sir. I mean, it's like aphrodisiac, or see, they are, sir. And the thing is, if you find them, do get in touch with us right away. They're a sort of, like, about the size of a hasprin, and they're yellow. So, oh, and they taste of peppermint. <laughs> The second I found out them sheep was missing, I phoned up PC Potts. And where was he? Where he always is, out the back, sitting on his big back. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing results. Either that or he's on with that barmaid. The one with the big... Because <laughs> he reckons he's gonna... <laughs> I said, you want to watch out? I said, you'll be putting her in the... <laughs> I'll find out about that. You come along and cut off your... <laughs> but I tell you something, I was walking across the meadow the other day, across the meadow, and I suddenly had an urgent desire to have... <laughs> so I goes 
along and I find this ditch and I stand there and I start all <laughs> over a feces box. He looks up, he says, <laughs> Stud, he says, he says, I said, here, hold on. I said, I've got a lady up here. He says, where do you think I've got down here? Then? <laughs> and that's why he's getting on about me and Pete Sheet. That's why. That's what that is all about. Here in the West Country, things move quickly these days. And already, the barren sheep land has been taken over by a herd of cows. Nathan Wide, News at 10, Wessex. I have a wondrous tale I would impart, though you may think it is not worth a fart thing to. <laughs> in my tale is one Bo Peep who one day was accounting of her sheep and by the counting of them did she fall asleep. Thus did they depart. One of them a black sheep whose fleece was black as soot and wheresoe'er the black sheep went his sooty footy foot. <laughs> the black sheep left the moor as sly as any elf and yet in truth he was as black as any moor himself. One frivolous lamb, a reckless beast, who took to gambling and thus was fleeced. <laughs> a ram, a horned ram, <laughs> who did his mistress's entreaty spurn and lost himself at trying to make a U-turn. <laughs> One masochistic lamb who threw the stinging nettles hops but stops upon occasion to smack his chops. <laughs> One foolish sheep who near the village frolics. <laughs> A shepherd caught him by the home for alcoholics. <laughs> One queer sheep who, although sad, was gay and when air approached would turn the other way. His wool is spun into a yarn so thin, but not as thin as this yarn which I now spin. Her father counselled her, pay them no mind, they will return, a bringing of their tails behind. But as the smallest of these lambs who sat upon the icy ground did cry in voice so bold, so do I say to you, my tale is told. <laughs> Commissioner sought out a box of strawberries. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wait, Chief. Who's room is for here? I'm excited. Ed. It's all right. Now then, what can I do for you, madam? Could you speak up a little, please? Is something distressing you? Oh, well, maybe your husband can help me. Yeah. What seems to be the trouble, sir? Sorry. It's our daughter. Your daughter. Oh. Chief, I. I think it's serious, Chief. Oh. oh, how do you spell that? I can't say as I've heard of her. She doesn't have many friends. Well, that doesn't surprise me, I must say. Where is this girl the moment is she arrives? She's outside in the corridor, Chief. Well, then why don't we have her in? Oh, well, she's evidently in a state of shock. She doesn't seem to be acting in a rational manner. You mean to tell me you think you're acting in a rational manner? I don't want to see this girl. I want to see her now. Get her in. Oh, won't somebody help me, please? I can't believe it. It's like some terrible, frightening dream. It was last Thursday. I was alone in the meadow with my sheep, and this man came by, had wide, staring eyes. Oh, God, they said I hypnotized me. He, he gave me a drink of water, and it tastes kind of strange, and suddenly the whole world was spinning and falling, and all the demons of hell were let loose in my head. I screamed and fell. I must have passed out, because when I came to, all my sheep were gone, and the great meadow was empty. It was horrible, horrible. You want to tell me about it? I just did. So you did. I wasn't listening to me. It seems to me that whoever has 
that the chief has to spend a lot of time with them, looking after them, tending them, watering them, feeding them. Why don't we have that fella in that we brought in on a 747? But he was just a, a vagrant chief. I want to see him, and I want to see him now, so bring him in. That's him! Hey, hold it, That's hold it, him! Hold it, oh, hold it, 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 Chief, how did you know it was him? I had my suspicions the minute he told me his name. What's your name again, son? Basil Bassy, <laughs> Chief of Ironside. I want you to know that I'm sorry I doubted your veracity. Oh, I lost that years ago. <laughs> Good evening, Chief Ironside. Good evening, Luigi. Now tell me, what have, uh, what have you got for this young lady here? We have a uh, mutton broth, mm -hmm. sheep's head soup. Oh. Lamb chops, <laughs> roast lamb, <laughs> and lamb cutlets. <laughs> Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, for being with us, and we look forward to seeing you all again very, very soon. Till then, bye bye.